is working. Um, I still don't have um, Dave Allred, but we are live on YouTube. Okay, thank you, Annette. Uh, we'll just let Dave join us. Um, we will call this meeting to order. And Jennifer, would you please call the roll? Curran. I am present via Zoom, Niles Township. Meeks. Present via Zoom, Ben Charter Township. Volrath is absent. Werfel. Present via Zoom, Royalton Township. Mr. Chair, you have three present, one absent. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes of March 24th, 2021. Need a motion. Can I make the motion? I'll support. Hey, thank you. Is there any discussion? Jennifer, would you please call the roll? Curran? Yes. Meeks? Yes. Volrath is absent. And Werfel? Yes. Mr. Chair, you have three A's. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Next item on the agenda, Road Department Project Update, Kevin Stack. Good morning, Kevin. How are you this morning? Good morning. How are you guys doing? Doing well. I just have one favor to ask of you as you begin. Over in the right column, there is HMA, scratch and seal, and ultra thin and slurries. As you go through that, would you just briefly explain to the committee what each one of those uh, uh, applications is, please? Absolutely. I can do that. Okay, the floor is yours, Kevin. Um, Brian, are you going to share a screen or do I need to share a nice screen? Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is just a brief update on our construction schedule. Um, we kind of what's been going on here for the past couple months on the local side. I'm going to start with the local side first, um, as that, that's the one that's uh, trying to get out and get all the agreements in place. Um, so we're going to go to the next slide. Just made a couple bullet points here that all local projects have been bid out. Um, those were open last week, including HMA, which is our two inch overlay, the scratch course and the ultra thins. Um, they've all been open. And I guess a broad picture of all those is we're seeing a lower HMA unit cost per ton than what we were anticipating. So that's kind of a, a good news side on our side um, to see that moving forward. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, this will start real quick. Um, I'm just going to kind of cruise these, but this is a local road two inch HMA overlay. So the HMA treatment type is what we refer to when it's just a simple two inch overlay. Um, again, this is for this year. Uh, the road class is either local or subdivision. Um, and then the road name, Termini Township, uh, the road department districts in, and the quantity of miles. Uh, so here you can see Ridge Road, Lakeshore Road, and Chickamee. Rufal Subdivision, this is up in Coloma. Um, several different roads within that subdivision. Uh, Hillendale Road, uh, South Walnut Court, uh, Maiden Lane, Michigan Shores, and Pontiac Road um, are all in that one. Uh, the next slide uh, we'll go to is just a map that kind of visually sees. I couldn't fit this all on one page. So this is the north half of the county, just kind of showing where those projects were um, and just giving you an idea of how they're spaced out. And then the next slide will show you South County, uh, kind of where those projects lay uh, in retrospect to everywhere else. Um, the next slide, uh, we'll get into more of the scratch course. Now, the scratch course is kind of a new fix type for us over the past probably three years. Instead of grinding and graveling the road, uh, the road's not failed quite bad enough to do that, but yet it's not in good enough condition to just seal coat. So we've introduced this new fix type of a scratch and seal, where we have a paving company come in and basically put an inch to inch and a half of asphalt down um, on average. So what that means is you may still see the center line of the existing road because they're running the paver so tight, but they're running an automation of 2% crown out to the edge of the road. So the edge of the road could see an inch of asphalt, it could see two inches of asphalt, it could see three inches of asphalt, depending on how bad the road is. All it's doing is correcting the crown of the road and the viability. Once that's done, our crews then come in later and seal coat that road to seal because it's a very thin layer of asphalt in the center. And if we don't get a sealing layer on that, allow the water to get in and start popping it immediately. So we want to get on that right away. So this is just a list of the local roads that are receiving that treatment type. Um, Painter School Road in Berrien Township, South Euclid and Benton, Baldwin and Lake, Marquette Woods in Royalton, uh, South Wolcott, which is in Chickamine, uh, Benton Center Road uh, up here in Benton Township, Hanover Road in Chickamine, Minich and Chickamine, and Empire in Benton. Um, there's the next slide to this uh, for more of those roads that we've done. If you want to switch to that one, there it is. 
so Portage Road, uh, Fourth Road, Tamarack Drive, uh, Notre Dame uh, in Lincoln, Stromer, New Buffalo, North Lemon Creek. Uh, North Lemon Creek, that is a little segment you kind of forget about. It actually runs off M139. It's a very short section on Oakland Township. It's not the actual long section of Lemon Creek that uh, everyone's used to traveling. Uh, Harrison Street up in Hager, uh, Abel and Buchanan, and West Street Cool. Um, so the next slide just kind of shows those maps of that area. Um, North County, the red boxes you can see are all the different projects in North County. And then the next slide will show South County. Um, again, of how those are spread out throughout the county there. Uh, the following slide gets into our ultra things. Now, uh, not to be confused between ultra thin and scratch course. Scratch course is just a grade correcting uh, application. Ultra thin is about a three quarters of an inch thick asphalt um, that is placed that we normally use in our subdivisions and sometimes we use out on uh, decent roads that just needed a quick overlay. Uh, townships use this a lot as the one subdivisions that provides a nice smooth surface, uh, not the seal coating, you know, rough texture wearing course that you see out on the uh, more populated roads out in the country. Uh, provides a little bit better uh, conditions for, you know, a family to ride their bike, skateboard, you know, anything that they want to do inside a subdivision. Um, it provides, it holds up very well. And Jim, I think I see your hand moving, sorry. Question, Brian. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, on, uh... On these particular ones here, are these a result of your meetings with the townships? Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm glad you brought that. So all this local list has been uh, vetted with townships. We meet with townships. This year we actually met with all the townships via Zoom at uh, once uh, in early November, presented this plan based on our asset management saying here is the list of roads based on PACER data, condition of road, what we're recommending the fixed type be. And some of those lists, we, we overcompensate saying we understand your budget, let's say is $100,000. We're giving you $150,000 worth of roads. Is there a priority in here? These are the roads that need to be fixed that can be addressed. Is there a priority that you have a, you know, more priority to fix this one over that? So we kind of gave that broad spectrum, vetted it, got that, you know, approved roughly with them. It's not an official document. It's just, yeah, we're comfortable with that. Then we move through the estimating process to get the actual engineer estimate in place, and then the bidding process to get the actual cost, which are where we stand today. So yes, those are discussed with the townships. Okay, thank you for that. No problem. Um, so ultra thins, like I said, are, are in our subdivisions. Uh, I will say Lincoln Township is probably the uh, biggest uh, township that's been using this. Uh, good, good display of how it works. They've been doing it for almost 10 years now. And they're now just getting back to those subdivisions they did originally, and they are in still condition, a uh, good condition with that ultra thin. So it's a promising uh, sales pitch we're able to give the townships. Like it does work, it's proven itself, and it's a good fix. So on these real quick, again, some of these are subdivisions uh, that have several roads in them. Uh, so like the Sanctuary Subdivision in Lincoln, uh, Lake Pines, Cedar Hedge. So I mean, subdivisions have multiple roads, so that's why you're only seeing the subdivision name. Um, but again, Lincoln Township, you can see right here, they have a lot um, that they normally do. Uh, Forest Hills in St. Joe, Windsor Drive in St. Joe, Bondale and Asparagus and Water Belite. Um, and the next slide just shows a little bit more uh, what else is out there um, that we are doing subdivision wise. And then the next slide will give you a quick map of those. Again, North County, you can see Lincoln and St. Joe are uh, big, big candidates of using it. Water Belite and Coloma have been using it as well. Uh, they've uh, experimented with it and it's worked very well. Next slide will show South County a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry, it won't show South County because there's no South County projects for the ultra thins as you don't get into the major subdivisions. Uh, real quick, uh, the primary road list. So the primary road list that is out for bid um, that should be opening up tomorrow, I believe is uh, these selected right here. So we got Bell Road in Niles Township, Pawpaw Avenue up in Coloma, Pokagon Road, which is in Berrien Township, Pipestone Road, which is in Sodus, and Lakeside Road, which is in Chickenwood. Uh, these are the only primary roads that we have out uh, right now. We do have the rest of them um, surveyed and ready to go. However, we're just watching what asphalt prices are doing uh, so we can understand what, what we're going to have to uh, budget and what we can't, can't afford to do this year. So the next slide, we'll just kind of give a breakdown of mapping where that's at. So here's Paul Pop up here in Waterloo, Coloma. Here's Pipestone uh, down here in Sodas Township. Uh, the next slide will show um, South County where we have Lakeside over here near the lake. 
and then you can see Pokagon at the county line and then Bell Road uh, down in Niles Township. Uh, the last ones uh, that I had to look at um, is a primary scratch course in federal aid. Um, so again, we have a couple of roads primary wise that we're doing the scratch course to. Uh, we saw a very good use of it um, with our Lincoln Road project last year, taking a pretty beat up road uh, and converting into a scratch and seal road. So these are Beans Hill and Berrien, East Colleen, Three Oaks, Hill and Dale and River. Um, and so does Township that are going. Uh, the next slide will just show a quick map of where those are. Um, like I said, those are due back from bid tomorrow. And then the last section is um, our HMA, or I'm sorry, our federal aid projects, uh, showing our federal aids for this year. Um, you'll notice that uh, Red Arrow and Union Pier is listed here. That's because it's still it's a project from last year, but it's still ongoing. Um, and then we have the Napier Bridge over St. Joe River, Walton Road Bridge over St. Joe River, uh, Portage Road uh, in Bertrand Township from Briar Road to US 12, uh, Red Arrow Highway, uh, which is the Harbor area from Sawyer Road down to Main Drive, which is just south of Harbor Road. Washington Avenue, uh, Hilltop to Maiden Lane, and then you see Union Pier in here again, just because there's two different townships involved in that, so we're just tracking that in two different townships. Yes, Mr. Kern. Kevin, the uh, couple of projects there involving uh, Red Arrow Highway, is that in conjunction with the, the trail project? So no, so these are isolated projects. So the Red Arrow Union Pier project started uh, almost three years ago in a high level scoping with the townships. Um, that started a design, it was an isolated project with a non-motorized path for that um, area to connect itself from one point to another. Harbor Road, uh, we did go through and design it, uh, that two miles to anticipate the non-motorized trail as it affects grading and drainage for the actual road. So we did design it in there. However, it, only a small section of it's gonna actually be built uh, from Harbor Road up to the Harbor Community Park, uh, just to allow for safe travel ways in there and to connect all the drainage that's required in that section of it. Okay, thank you. And I believe that's all I have uh, for the presentation, except okay. for that. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, any questions for uh, Kevin? Commissioner Meeks, I have one. Go ahead, Dan. I wanted to know a little more about how these these roads are picked to be worked on. You said some you meet with the townships or, or the township. You meet do the do you, they meet with the township and the township decide to tell them which roads they want to get done first. I'm so what we do is how oh, the process is done. So what we do is we have an asset management uh, that we've developed that looks at a rating of the roads. So we rate all the roads in the county on a by year period. So we'll go out and give, it's called PACER rating. It gets rated on a one through 10, one being a poor road, 10 being a good road. It's based on what you're seeing, the conditions of that road. It's a standard across the state. Um, you have to be trained in it to actually do that evaluation. And it's done in a group uh, of people. So you have multiple eyes looking at it. We do that South County gets it done one year and North County gets it done the following year. Uh, we stay on that rotation so we have data showing us exactly what those roads are doing. When we look at that data, we can start seeing, you know, where our networks of roads are failing, uh, where they're in good condition and where they're in fair condition. So when we start looking at that, we look at ADT traffic counts on the roads, and then we look at arteries. Are these roads supplying you from point A to point B, uh, like Napier, or are they you know, just kind of getting you into the country or how are they rated or where they are at. So we'll go through and we'll go into each township, look at those ratings, pick those roads based on how they're triggered and what's requiring work now. And if some townships, uh, it gets difficult to pick because they have decent roads. Other townships, we have such an array of roads that need fixed, we're able to provide that list more than what they can afford. So then they can prioritize which ones they feel are more of need than what we're able to see. So that's how that's selected. You give them a dollar amount that you're gonna, that I'm they sorry, can spend. You broke up there, Mr. Meeks, I didn't hear you. Well, so basically you kind of give them maybe a, you say you might have like 10,000 or 20,000, maybe 100,000 that can be spent on these roads and they pick where they want to put it at by the condition of the roads. And yep. I don't, am I correct? 
Yeah, we advise them, here's the list of roads. We're trying to kind of say, this is the list of roads that our professional ability we're looking at that need to be addressed. And then ask them, is, if you're able to afford all these, these are what we recommend, or is there any other that we're not seeing? If they can bring one to the table and say, well, we noticed this one's not bad, but it's not showing up on your list. We're like, all right, let's look at it, because you know we may have missed it. And then we'll start looking at things like that. It's like, well, what's the ADT on that? Is it more important than this road? And start playing that 20 questions to make sure that we're spending the money properly. Okay, well, that explains a lot to me. Thank you. No problem. Julie, did you have a question? I do. I have a few, actually. Um, thank you for the presentation. I really appreciate that. Um, also, uh, are these all the projects that are going on or just the ones that are out to bid or currently bid? The bids these are, ones in. That are currently bid and, and going out. So right now we have our, so this is our local program and primary program that we have out to bid. Once we get those bids back opened up, uh, our main function is trying to get to the local program out uh, because it, it requires a little bit more uh, documentation as far as getting agreements out and things like that. So that's what we'll focus on first. The primaries are going to open this week. We'll be able to see what asphalt costs are doing. What we're waiting for is our federal aids. Our federal aids don't open up until May and June. Um, so we don't know what the exact cost of those are going to be. We have to move forward with the federal aids based on the agreements with MDOT and federal highway and how that funding works. So we're kind of waiting to see what those prices will do when they come back to determine if there's more primary roads that we can send out from there. But these are all the projects in for 2021? These are not all the projects. They're only the projects that are out for bid right now. Okay. Local wise, local wise, yes, they are all the projects. The only ones that you're not seeing all of them is the primary road. Okay. Um, so with that being said, then I have a few questions on my township specific. Mm -hmm. um, SOTUS um, on your local roads of the Hillendale, Naomi to Pipestone, um, they had asked for that to be moved out to 2022. Yes, and that's on our notes. That's, I just didn't get updated in our sheet right then, but when the agreement goes out, there's an update that has to go through based on those meetings that we've had with SOTUS. So they did take the section of Hillendale out from Naomi to Pipestone. They are partnering with us on a scratch and seal from Naomi North. Uh, they are partnering with us because that's the primary section up there. The original plan was to try and do both sections, but after meeting with the townships probably about a couple weeks ago, um, it was determined that they wanted to remove that one off and add the scratch and seal. Only. Okay, so, so yeah. that will be moved off. Yeah, exactly. And then on St. Joe Township, they had five additional roads uh, in subdivisions that were supposed to be on the list that are missing for local roads. Which one would that be? Nelson, Maiden Lane, Western, Hoover, and Brown School. Um, I will have to verify those. I don't recall never seeing those in their plan, but I'll definitely look and communicate with Denise. Denise sent That's these awesome. over to me and said this is from the list that you had sent her. So, yeah, so I, I just saw an email come through from Denise about 40 minutes ago, so I got to make contact with her uh, before we finalize any list to make sure that we're all on the same page and ready to go. Okay, and then that brings me to my last question, and that is, are all townships represented equally um, with the funding that we received in Act 51 and those projects without consideration of their local monies? Because I know like St. Joe Township has a lot of projects, but they contribute a lot of money also additionally. So how our, our I mean, this is more of a question for our finance uh, director and how they set that up was through our master schedule with previous management, they allocated a certain amount of primary roads to be converted to local match. And then that local, that amount of money was ran through the same process of what, how the Act 51 is through the state based on road mileage and population and distributed that way to each township. So all townships are represented in this year's plan? Um, the only township that I have not heard anything from, and I know that I haven't gotten any correspondence would be Niles Township. Thank you. Yep. Okay, any other questions for Kevin? Kevin, I have just one question. The, uh, uh, the project that the state is doing, uh, connecting the 31 bypass, um, how is that impacting the availability of the road builders? Are they being tied up with the state contracts and, and not available or not? That was our fear last year uh, that that would happen, but we are not seeing it happen right now. Um, normally something that big, you get out of area contractors. So I know like the main contractor for that is from Northern Michigan. 
Uh, so we've dealt with them a couple of times, but they haven't been on our projects in a while. So it's not tying up like the Kalins. Uh, Reith and Riley is the contractor on that project for paving, I believe. Uh, they're still bidding our projects at a good price and getting a couple of them. But Michigan Paving uh, as a paving contractor is, from what I understand, has plenty of capacity in their schedule still. Well, that's good news. I'm glad to hear that. Um, now, there was also, we were we were informed, and I, I don't remember all the details, Kevin, but um, part of that MDOT project had <clears throat> some of our roads being uh, closed, blocked off, mm -hmm. and repaved. Uh, they were going to pay to have all those roads uh, repaved. When would that begin? That's the, that's the question that we've been asking, kind of getting an idea in the state, still working on that schedule, because there is a handful of roads that the state is going to pay for us uh, under their dime because they'll either be under detour routes for that project or there'll be um, you know heavy amounts of traffic being put on them while they do that. So we have negotiated uh, upwards of $2 million worth of paving through that project that we're still kind of waiting to see when that time schedule is going to happen. Okay. And, and again, I don't recall, what's a, the, the total length of time uh, to complete the MDOT? How, how long are they work looking at? A year or two, three? Um, it's in phases. I know that project I think is scheduled for completion uh, end of 2023, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, great. All right, thanks. Any other questions for Kevin? All right, Kevin, thank you for that update. Thanks for being here. Uh, you bet, appreciate it. Um, I see uh, Commissioner uh, Volrath is present. Um, Dave, would you please report out tomorrow on the 911 capital improvement discussion? Uh, you're as familiar with it as I am. Would you please do that for me tomorrow? I can't see you, Dave. Are you muted? He's talking. Dave, I got three computers and my phone going. I'm still having trouble getting on these damn meetings. I got a new computer. All I got is new issues. <laughs> okay, would you mind? Yes I, yes, I will. If I'm on this all the way to the end of this, I guarantee you I'll report on it tomorrow. And... Okay, great. I appreciate that. No problem. Okay. Then that brings up the next item on our agenda, and that's the 911 capital improvement discussion. Uh, Caitlin Sampson, our 911 director, and John Axe, who is our uh, bond attorney. And I don't see them on my screen, so if you folks are present, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, we've gone over a lot of this information before, so I'm going to try to be brief um, to not take up too much of your time. I know you're very busy today. So I'm going to share my screen here. <clears throat> All right. There you, go. you should be able to see my presentation now. And let me make sure that you have the right one. Okay. So yeah, this is John Axe. I'm on here now. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. So, uh, John, I'm just going to go through some brief background information for the commissioners uh, and then uh, have you jump in as well. Okay, fine. Thank you. Okay, so we're talking again about the 800 megahertz radio coverage in our county with the MPSES, which is the Michigan Public Safety Communication System. Uh, so this is our map of the Michigan system. And down in the left-hand corner, you'll see again our county. You've seen these graphics before. This is just an updated uh, topology map that the state has put out since the last time I spoke with you. Um, but nothing has changed as far as our county goes. So this is um, our, one of our internal maps that we have as far as our different sites on the MPSCS. Um, so Water Valley is that new one up in the right hand corner. That's going to be connected by fiber. This map has not been updated yet to show that fiber connection, but it will be tied in to our county dispatch center and then out uh, towards the Lansing area as well to back into the system. So that will make us redundant so that we're no longer on a spur line uh, and we've got connections in two different ways. This is our current signal coverage. Uh, the purple coloring is where the coverage is at that 95% confidence rate for portable in the street coverage. Um, and then of course it says Lakeland Hospital site on there, but this is not with that contributing. All right, so as far as our coverage enhancements. Uh, so you had asked me some questions last time I spoke with you about uh, Grand Beach site in particular and the Water Valley site, what we've done to enhance the system and coverage in our area. 
So uh, the Grand Beach site uh, was a site that was added in 2006 on the Grand Beach water tank. Uh, and that one we were authorized uh, with the wireless surcharge funds uh, up to about 1.2 million for that site. Um, and as a result of adding that site to the system, the um, Michigan State uh, Department of Information Technology granted us a 50% user fee credit. And we've talked about those credits briefly before. Um, so what that allows us to do uh, is originally there were annual user fees uh, for each radio that was on the system. Those were discontinued uh, in 2015 and what was adopted in its place was a $250 activation fee for new radios being added to the system. So the county credits that we've received from doing these infrastructure enhancements uh, to the MPSCS have been used in order to cover those activation fees now. Um, so uh, before when they were still doing the annual user fee, we were covering the annual user fee and there was an agreement amongst all of the agencies that they would still continue to pay that fee, but they would pay that fee to us and it would be placed in an 800 megahertz reimbursement fund that would be used to further enhance the system. Once the, the annual fees went away in 2015, we stopped invoicing the departments for the active, that fee, which would now be the activation fee. So we're no longer bringing in any revenue um, from uh, those fees. Uh, so we are, the agencies are benefiting from the credits that are in place. Um, and we still have a balance of uh, over $450,000 and we will be getting some additional credits as well coming up. But so then uh, with Grand Beach, also the was originally a T1 link back to the system and that wasn't adequate. So in 2012, there was an upgraded link done with microwave and that cost us about another uh, 135,000 for the push to or point to point, excuse me, upgrade. And that came out of that 800 megahertz reimbursement fund that I just mentioned. Um, then we also had an enhancement at the, with the system at the jail. Uh, in 2008, we erected a new site there at the jail, uh, and that was paid for um, in part through a public safety interoperable communications PSIC grant. Uh, and then we had a 25% match paid for by 911. Uh, so the total cost of that was uh, close to one and a half million. Uh, with that 25% match, then the cost to the county uh, was that 25% of it. So, and that was paid for out of the 800 megahertz credit reimbursement fund and the 911 wireless fund. So then uh, we know that we needed some coverage enhancements still. Uh, state line and the Northeast up in Waterville, Cloma areas uh, are the most in need of that enhancement. So the northeast uh, portion of the county was determined to be uh, the solution that we would uh, work towards first uh, for a number of reasons, which we've discussed before. But so we installed a full or are installing a full MPSTS ASR site, which is an area site repeater. Uh, on top of Spectrum Lakeland Waterley Hospital. Uh, the contract cost was $637,702. We paid $200,000 200, down from that 800 megahertz credit reimbursement fund. Uh, we've got additional charges in there with licensing fees, fiber, and et cetera. So um, our, our total cost at this time is approaching $670,000. Uh, we will get an additional MPSCS credit uh, of a little over $31,000. We're just waiting on the updated agreements from the Attorney General's office uh, to finalize all of that. So as far as coverage enhancement on the left, you see that is our current coverage. On the right, you see with Lakeland Hospital site turned on, these are the models as to what that will do for our coverage. So then, uh, you know, we still have that area down at the state line that possibly needs some enhancement. Uh, so the first solution that comes into mind, we've talked about this before, is that critical connect IP interface between the Michigan system and the Indiana system. Um, that is still in progress uh, between Indiana and Michigan. 
And then there's the possible need for additional infrastructure build out that we've been discussing. So Motorola has provided us with some models here of um, what coverage looks like and what it could look like. Now, what's going on, we talked about this a little bit last time I spoke with you, was that if we add another site to the county, because of the demand for frequencies, there is a need to go to a simulcast system. And that means that each site would have more frequencies, um, but they would all share the same ones. So all the sites within Berrien County would essentially act like one site. They would all turn up um, for the traffic. So on the left, you see the existing coverage once Lakeland Hospital is in place, the model. And then on the right, you see what that will look like if we just went to simulcast. And that projection was a cost of about $4 million, rough estimate. So you get some benefit just from going to simulcast and having the towers all work together at the same time. Um, but it doesn't fill in all of those gaps that have been identified either. Caitlin? Yes, sir. Um, you may have covered this, but I, I may have missed it. Um, are we being forced to go to this system by the FCC or by the state, the MPSC? Are we being forced to go to simulcast? So if we add another site, if we want to add a site down in the south part of the county, we will be forced to go to simulcast because of the demand on frequencies. But we are not currently being forced. Does that answer your question, sir? Um, is it is it just because we are adding one more tower onto the system? Like six is the magic number. Once you go to seven, you got to simulcast them. Yeah. So our county has a number of towers um, compared to a lot of areas, and that's in part because of our local in large part because of our location. I um, mean, you know, down in the corner of the state, the shape of our county, we don't have a lot of signal coming in from, you know, if we had surrounding counties around us that were also contributing to the Michigan system. Um, so we do have a lot of sites within Berrien County. Um, and because of the demand for frequency um, across the board nationwide, it's difficult to get frequencies <clears throat> Excuse me. In fact, our water elite site, we have some of those frequencies are outside of the public safety designated range. Um, so we're getting that non public safety uh, frequency licensing. Um, so they're all licensed frequencies. Um, so that's fine. It's just it's, it's harder to get those. Okay, so that, that would be the push for why they would make us to go to simulcast. Right. And, and the 911 communications committee that I do not sit on, but I do sit on 911, um, you're still discussing options for that South County area, the Southeast, correct? Yeah, so I've been in communication with Motorola. We have uh, our representative on here today too to help answer any questions if needed. Uh, and with the state, with MPSCS, as far as potential sites. So what you're seeing now in front of you are possible sites for signal coverage enhancement. Uh, down in the South County portion. Um, and then we're also exploring other sites. Uh, Bertrand Township has uh, provided us with some additional site possibility information as well as SMACUS. So that's been forwarded to Motorola and they are taking a look at those right now as well. Um, so on the left, you'll see a Buchanan green site. What that means is that it's a, uh, it would be a brand new build. There's not existing tower there. And that's a model as to what that would do for our coverage. And then on the right, you see a, the site of where the Nile City water tank is, which is where our um, VHF site down there uh, is located. Uh, however, they're recommending that if we were to put a site there that we would not use the water tank itself, we would build a new tower um, for cost saving reasons and also just complications with using water tanks, et cetera. Um, but these are two proposed sites that could help. Um, our uh, land description GIS department is also helping us. Um, they're going to be providing us with some information about the county owned or state owned properties down in that area as well that um, might be more site considerations. We need to find what is the what would be the best site um, for our reasons, our reasons here uh, to get us the most bang. Um, then, you. yes, sir. Um, on those towers, um, if it's an existing tower, 
-hmm. that we could put an antenna on, is that still considered an additional tower or an additional, it, does it push us over that number again where we have to simulcast? It does. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can I ask you a question also, Caitlin? Yes, please. Could you go back a slide? I sure can. It looks like when we go from the existing to the simulcast that we lose uh, connectivity just offshore, like it looks right around the pier area. Is that true? You're looking up here? Yeah. Yeah, so um, we have discussed with them about that. And one of the differences with simulcast is they really focus on the in-county coverage versus uh, the out in the water. Um, however, just because that that um, the coloring there is a little bit different doesn't mean that there's not coverage there. Uh, additionally, we do get some coverage from even um, over the lake as well. But yeah, there are some changes on these models and we did question that also. Um, Bill, did you want to pipe up and explain that any further than what I was able to? Certainly happy to. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, Bill and Motorola. Um, I'll just say that uh, when it comes to the coloring and the, the see on the maps here, uh, just because you see uh, blank or if it's a slightly different color does not in any way mean that there is no coverage. It's strictly just to emphasize that um, it is below the 95% threshold that we hold it to. So your coverage might be just fine there, uh, but we like to keep it at mission critical 95% certainty, which is why we reflect that on these maps. Thank you. And the differences in color on this map, I know the coloring is a little bit different from those prior ones that we were looking at, um, that the purple color is portable on the hip uh, in building. And then the green coloring is in the street with that portable on the hip. Okay. Um, so then, uh, as we were saying, these are two potential sites and we are looking at other options as well um, for, we need to make sure that we are getting it, if we're going to put a site in that we're putting in where it's gonna be most beneficial. Um, the state has also offered to help us by doing a, a small coverage study in that area, which will also help with making decisions. Uh, and so I am going to be working with the uh, ambulance and fire departments down there in order to determine what those points are that we need to specifically look at um, to make that decision. Caitlin, using round numbers, um, a tower to construct is roughly two million and to go to the simulcast is roughly four. That's correct. Um, they have provided us just those rough numbers of about four million for going to simulcast and then one and a half to two million for building a new tower. And a lot of that cost is not necessarily just in the tower construction itself, but in the engineering um, and in the equipment that goes on that tower. Okay, thank you uh, for that answer and for that uh, presentation. I assume this is where we're gonna bring John X in. Yeah. As how to pay for that $6 million price tag? Yes. John, would you please uh, take it from here? Okay. Uh, well, basically, we can issue capital improvement bonds to build whatever additional facilities you need. The, uh, the trick is to figure out how we're going to raise the money to pay off the capital improvement bonds. Now, there are two general... Uh, possibilities. One would be uh, have an election uh, and at that election authorize an increase, a specific increase for this for the purposes of, of this project that whatever was included uh, to raise that uh, specific uh, charge and uh, that would be paid by then any users of phones in the county in, in Berrien County. Uh, the other alternative would be to have a millage election, and you have some of that already, uh, I think, uh, for some purposes. Uh, either one of those would need to go on the ballot. Uh, if it goes on this year, it would be a special election, uh, one of which well, you can you can only have three of those a year. I mean, even in, in even if they're specials. Uh, the first one that you could possibly get on would be the primary election, but 
Uh, and you would have to actually adopt something during the month of April to do that. Uh, the second one uh, would be uh, a November election. Uh, and when I say the primary, I mean an August election. There isn't really a primary this year. Uh, and then uh, next year, if you waited, uh, there are there will be an August primary in in uh, in 2022. Uh, both the primary and the general election. You would not have those wouldn't be special elections. So, like, if you if you put a ballot proposition on, you have to pay a certain amount of money to cover the uh, cost of uh, holding the special election. Uh, hey, John, this is Jim Curran. Um, I, I understand. I'm trying to digest the two options. I understand the millage. You put a millage on the ballot, goes on property taxes to pay for this. Explain to me a little bit more in detail the, the other one you talked about. The, is it a surcharge to, for all? It is a surcharge. Ones? It's a surcharge, specific surcharge, and it would it would uh, specify how much that would be. Uh, and uh, actually, they did a, exactly that in Branch County uh, at the primary last year and authorized an increase, uh, a specific increase, and it was really for the same kind of a project. In other words, it was covering uh, 911 services throughout the county, in, in Branch County. Uh, and that did approve, that did get passed, and we're uh, actually in the process of issuing bonds secured by that money, uh, uh, which we will be delivering, I think, next week. So that actually does work. You can do it. Uh, obviously, uh, Anytime you have a, a campaign, whether it's for millage or for this, you have to, you have to do a, a good explanation so the voters know what you're doing. Uh, but uh, either of those alternatives are, are reasonable. Um, in some ways, I think the, the surcharge may be better because if you do a millage, uh, you know, people paying the millage may not have huge phone systems, but they might have a lot of property. And, and of course, the property gets taxed by the millage, whereas uh, the surcharge would be at least more related specifically to telephone use. Uh, and uh, John, that's the, the, the two basic ways you do it. Okay, in the uh, in the Branch County example, um, I would imagine you ha you are able to estimate how many cell phones there are in Berrien County. Uh, and then you would, we would have an idea of how much that surcharge would be before it goes on the ballot. Absolutely, that's what they did down there. Uh, they they calculated it. They it, it's it's laid out quite specifically. I have a, a a lot of information on what they did, and uh, I can make that available to you when if you decide you'd like to explore that. Uh, in addition to that, and this is actually fairly new, but I think, and I think you may know about it. Uh, the, they amended the Federal Communications Act, uh, which governs the federal communications system, uh, specifically in December of this year. And the FCC is in the process right now of developing uh, guidelines and rules to make sure that if you use the phone surcharge, that it's only for the 911 service. They don't want you uh, using it for other purposes. Uh, and that's uh, that's just being developed right now. And because we were working on a project for uh, the Southern County, we had to get into it to fi and find out what the details were. And uh, I know quite a lot more about that than I want to, to be honest with you, but uh, that will be of some value if you decide to go that route, because at least I'll know where we are now, this is a, a changing playing field. They're still in the process of, of uh, proposing the rules and having people make comments on it. And that we're in the middle of that period right now. So by, uh, by July, that'll be pretty well uh, uh, completed. And uh, I know uh, from talking to Caitlin that you've already put some comments in uh, with some of the other people in the state of Michigan on this. This incidentally, this particular effort by the federal government was basically because of some states, uh, I don't know exactly which ones, I think New York and New Jersey were included, where they were they, they felt that they were abusing the phone 
charges because they were using the money for other things. Uh, and so that's the purpose of these uh, new rules that they're working on. Okay, John, uh, at this point, may I ask you a question? Um, the FCC uh, is saying one thing, state of Michigan is saying something different. Uh, if push comes to shove, who do we follow? Well, <laughs> the state of Michigan uh, can't change the federal rules. The state of Michigan can comment on it. And in fact, the federal rules are generally supposed to be enforced with the assistance of the state. So the, the rules are will be established by the FCC. Uh, the states have an input in, into what the rules ought to be and how they are, you know, how they're implemented. The implementation of the rule is the critical piece of it. Uh, in a very general way, uh, the project which is being, uh, will be constructed in Branch County uh, appears to our firm, and we've gone over this considerably in the last month or so, uh, to qualify under the current rules as proposed. Now, those aren't final yet, and we don't know for sure whether the exact rules that we think they're going to put in are actually going to end up there, but we believe they will. And based on that information, and, and just to simplify it, if what you put on the tower and in the cars, that is down on the ground, for the people that, that relate to this system, basically relates to a 911 system, uh, then that's probably going to be acceptable. If, for instance, you build a tower and you rent spaces on the tower to other people for totally unrelated purposes, that probably will not qualify. That's just a very general statement, but it has to be pretty specifically related to 911 service in order to, uh, in order to uh, qualify under the rules as we see them developing. Uh, as we go forward, uh, I can keep you advised on that. Uh, because they're going to do that by, by July, that'll be pretty much in place. Um, and I can assure you that uh, the people in, in Branch and the other places that, are, that already have a, a phone surcharge are very concerned about this and want to make sure that, uh, that they'll be able to use it properly uh, under the law. Okay, thank you for that explanation, John, because I, I guess that's where I was coming from under the current rules. The uh, FCC doesn't define it that closely, but the state of Michigan does. In other words, the state of Michigan says, yes, you can use that money for tower construction and uh, tower maintenance, those type of things, where if the FCC changes the rules and says you can't, that's where we've got a problem, correct? Well, let's put it this way. If the FCC in the process of finalizing the rules were to do them in such a way that it would seriously restrict your ability to use this for the 911 system that you want to put in, then that obviously is a big problem. But I, we don't see that necessarily happening, but you can't say for sure yet. Part of the reason we don't is Michigan is not a state that anyone thinks has, has had a, abuses of this, or at least uh, Michigan hasn't been made an example of. And, and the people at, uh, at, at the state of Michigan level uh, are cooperating with the users that, that have this already uh, and in their submissions that have been made so far. So uh, they're working in tandem right now. And if, uh, if you decide to go forward and are, are interested in using the phone surcharge, uh, we, can, uh, we can help you. And I know Caitlin is pretty uh, up to date on this stuff. Uh, we can certainly help you with the new rules and uh, help you put comments in at such point as you want to. Now you're just developing your system, so it's a little harder to comment when, when you don't have a final system in place. Okay, what do you mean by not a final system in place? Because we're in still- other words, In other words, anything that you're going to do, you would actually put together a proposal uh, and, and assuming for the moment that it was to go on the ballot for uh, a, a telephone surcharge, that proposal would have elements of what you're going to buy and what, what's going to be put in there. Those are the critical things. 
if they are if they are specifically related to 911, and, and especially that they they fit under the rules, which are as I say being developed right now, then you wouldn't have a problem. It, there might be some gray areas in between, and if there are, uh, obviously we would want to make sure that the regulations would would permit you to do what you were wanting to do. Otherwise, you just wouldn't be able to use the phone surcharge money for it. That doesn't mean you couldn't you couldn't still do the the other stuff, but you'd have to have another way of paying for that. And basically, as long as it relates in a pretty direct way to 911, uh, you're probably going to be all right. That's what it appears like. Okay. Thank you, John. Appreciate that explanation. Um, and I would imagine that you and Caitlin are monitoring the, the FCC as they progress through the rule changes. We are. <laughs> We're going to be cons in, in con <laughs> consulting on that every probably every month at least uh, and maybe even more frequently than that because the, we're right in the middle of the period of when the rules are being uh, discussed and and reviewed and f uh, the finalization I think is in July okay thanks for that John uh, are there any questions from the committee members of John uh, or Caitlin for that matter mr. chair yes sir if if the committee can offer some guidance to, to me, to Caitlin, to Attorney Axe, on how often you want to see this coming back to the committee for discussion, that's that would help a lot. Um, I know we've hit you with a very big number, a wish list item, but um, if we can get just some guidance on how soon you want to continue this conversation, that would help allow us to figure out our workflow? Well, I think from the standpoint of, of what's being developed right now, the sooner you decide what you want and how you will go forward to get it, the better chance that Caitlin and I have to compare it to the rules and, and, and even put in comments or, or questions, which would be more logical, I think, actually, to, to call them. In other words, what they do is they, they, they come out with information, and then you have the right to ask questions about what, what does this mean and what, how does this impact us. So if, if, if in this particular situation, the county being us, it has decided on certain things, that at least we know that, and we can ask the questions that relate to that, or we can already see uh, their comments that have come out uh, and, and, and make a pretty good judgment as to whether it's going to qualify or not. Jim, can I, uh, Chair, can I ask a question? Sure, go right ahead. Um, since we've got Dan on the phone and maybe you guys have already talked about this, but is there any opportunity for recovery funds for this? Sorry, there we go. Can you hear me? All right. Yes, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Commissioner, we're actually we're looking into that actively as it, as it stands right now, the way that the Rescue Act is written. Um, this type of infrastructure would not be eligible for funding because the act specifically refers to water, sewer and broadband. Um, the National Association of Counties, I think the International Association of County City Managers and a number of different um, national local government associations have all asked for Secretary Yellen, Treasury Secretary Yellen, to clarify that provision in the act and to expand the definition of infrastructure to include things like, you know, what we're talking about here, which is 911 public safety capital expenses. So, you know, the longer, longest answer here is that there may be an opportunity, but it's going to depend entirely on how broadly the Treasury Department is going to interpret that provision of the Rescue Act. Okay. Thank you. And Treasury is doing about the same thing that FCC is, I assume. Are they? Do their rules have to come out for comment also? No, not under 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 the Rescue Act. The Secretary of the Treasury is given broad discretion to actually set the rules of how the money can be expended. What she obviously can't do is supersede the language of the Act itself. But right. The, the the hope is that she will see the phrase infrastructure water, sewer, broadband, and, and interpret that to be non-limiting examples of infrastructure. So it could include other infrastructure as well. 
So we're just going to have to wait and see how the guidance comes out on that. But I mean, clearly, we're hoping that it does get expanded. That perhaps we could throw some of the money at, at, at this issue. Brian, I think to answer your question, um, that really 911 is, is kind of driving this discussion. Um, so I would think after 911, um, either advisory tech or the communications meet, and there is something updated or something else to report to this committee, uh, then I would say, yes, schedule it. Uh, other than that, if there's really nothing new, um, then I don't see bringing this topic up uh, on a weekly basis just to keep it alive. Um, I would rather wait until after the 911 meets and then have Caitlin come to us uh, at the very next meeting for admin and give us an update. Caitlin, does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and I, I would like to request as the admin chair, if I could be invited to the 911 communications uh, committee, because I don't sit on that. I don't, I'm not privy to your communications conversations. And I think it may be helpful to have uh, one of our admin committee members uh, sit on that committee. Uh, so for clarity, we don't have a specific communications committee. Uh, we've been work, I've been working with the fire chiefs association communications subcommittee. Um, as far as helping them get um, through their grant processes and then working with them to get feedback as far as this portion. But all of the stuff for, for 911 is handled under advisory and our operations uh, committees. Okay, well that better explains it when you're talking about a fire department subcommittee, because I know their, some of their communications issues are, are unique to them. So I understand that. So as long as this is coming through uh, the 911 advisory and tech, uh, I do attend those meetings. So uh, I'm good there. And then uh, if you could just report to us after one of those meetings and give us an update, I think that would be sufficient. Sure. Okay, are there any more questions for, uh, for John or uh, uh, Caitlin from the committee members? I have none. Hey, Brian, do you have anything else while we're on this topic? So we've got um, the release of federal COVID fundings as your next agenda item. Uh, Mr. Chair, Brian, um, also, did you want to me to address the GIS uh, point layer at this point? That would make a lot of sense. Okay. Um, so transitioning topics still within the 911 realm, then um, the state of Michigan, you received information um, through Annette uh, from me for a 911 grant program that has been funded by the National Telecommunications and Information Administration and the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration. Um, those funds were provided to the state of Michigan and the state of Michigan has identified a uh, 911 grant program addressing uh, gap fills for a point layer um, for GIS mapping. Um, thank you. And this would be uh, our local uh, jurisdiction. So Berrien County has been identified by the state as a um, area that would be beneficial to receive these funds. It would be of no cost to the county to sign on as a participant in this opportunity. Um, it would require some participation by us, uh, mainly through our GIS land description department. And that's why we do have uh, Director Winans in the room as well um, to answer any additional questions. So we would provide them with some source data. Um, then the vendor would do the heavy lifting as far as putting uh, this point layer together. Uh, and we would be a part of those project meetings and then they would provide their work back to the county to review and we would work hand in hand with them to make sure that it was uh, correct. And then going forward after this point layer is established, uh, we would be responsible for ensuring that updates are made to the address point layer. Uh, we do not currently have an address point layer um, and it is, I understand, quite a lot of work to get this done. 
uh, if Lex wants to add anything to that discussion. Okay. Uh, basically, it is labor intensive. Uh, it's the address point layer. What they're going to be doing is they they would require us to provide them with our uh, parcel layer. They will then come through and do what's called centroids throughout the parcel layer to create the point file specific. Then they're going to manually move those points over top of a house or to a street or whatever it is that they want specific. Um, it is uh, very beneficial for us to have. It does save uh, storage space and everything in our um, the 911 system. And then it's actually uh, basically a way to uh, directly link someone in 911 to an exact address versus using attributed center lines and stuff like that, which has address ranges. So uh, this project is, uh, I see it as very important. Um, and as Caitlin was saying, uh, basically it would require us providing the, our data, our GIS uh, parcel data, we would then have to go back and once they review everything, we would have to go in and make corrections where corrections are needed. And then going further in the future, we're gonna have to go through and actually maintain the points. So very doable uh, and for the cost, which is virtually nothing, I think it's a, it's, it's a great project. One of the reasons that this is so important to in moving to next generation 911 is that calls will not be routed based on that tabular database like Lex was just mentioning with the street center lines. They'll be routed by GPS location. Um, and so that's what this address point layer is really beneficial in determining where that structure actually is, where that caller is. Okay. Thank you for that. Dave, if you'd report out on this also, it's it's kind of a companion with 911. So if you could cover that resolution, I would appreciate it. And uh, sure. Alexa, Caitlin, I would imagine that the, the data that's generated is still ours, correct? We have proprietary ownership of that data. Yeah, so we have an existing uh, memorandum of agreement with the state to be part of the 911 GIS uh, repository. And the uh, part of this participation in this grant opportunity is that the address point data would be uh, considered open data to provide maximum benefit across the state. Um, but that would be the address points only, no ownership information, any of that. Uh, the existing uh, memorandum of agreement that we have with the state does include uh, our GIS department's uh, price points as far as uh, for that proprietary data as you were just discussing. Uh, and okay. the, data, the data that's stored both at the county and at the state, that's not subject to FOIA, correct? Lex, do you have uh, probably a clearer answer than I do on that? So, uh, like, if we provide the, the GIS parcel layer and things of that nature for them to create this project, no, that's not going, that's not something that they're going to be putting into the, uh, into their system. Um, now, the products that they create after using our data, which here is just going to be a, an address number and, a, let's say, a street address and some very basic information, that they, that is information that they will be able to use um, in other departments in the state, and so will other counties. But there's no information in that, um, there's no information that I see there that is something we would protect. Okay, thanks for that explanation, because obviously I'm thinking of the privacy of the individual, and I understand the need you know, for our 911 center to have to have that information. It's just that that information should not be readily readily available to, to the public. And so I appreciate that answer. Thanks, Lex. Are there any questions from the committee members of Lex or Caitlin on the resolution? 
Okay, Dave, you have all you need to report out on that as well? Should have. Okay, very good. If there's- I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> okay, I know you said you had to go. Um, if there's no objections, we will move that resolution forward then. Okay, consider it moved. Thank you, Lex, and uh, thank you, Caitlin, and uh, John X. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Uh, we have some, some work to do and some things to consider, but we appreciate everything you gave us this morning. Thanks a lot. Thank you all for your time. We appreciate it. Okay, thank you again. Um, next item on the agenda is the uh, resolution uh, B2104193, Federal Release of COVID Funding. Uh, I assume that's Annette. Well, probably, uh, probably, yeah, me and Brian. Um, so I actually, while the meeting was going on, I did get an email from Arthur with regard to, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and go find it maybe. I don't know how to do this now. And, I, and I, I need to apologize. I've been in meetings since 9.30 this morning. I have not had a chance to even preview uh, this resolution at all. So I, I appreciate anybody's input. Mr. Chair okay. um, and Annette, I, I put the uh, the resolution up on the screen for the, the group. So that fourth whereas there where we refer to a particular plan, um, because this was, I guess, vetoed again, that that verbiage is no longer um, accurate. So the message is the same. Approve the money to be released and get the money out there to so it can help you know those in Michigan. Um, but Arthur is going to put together some little tweaking there with with regard to how that's expressed. So, um, but other than that, the, the same the resolution would come out with basically the same message. Okay, any comments on the uh, resolution from the committee members? I went through it pretty quick also, and but a couple of things that I caught on that, that fourth whereas, but maybe you're gonna fix it. And that's that 3.5 billion. Is that the amount that she's vetoed or is that the full amount of the original bill? So that was the amount that was referenced in, um, in that particular, in that particular bill. Cause the overall amount I think for the State was five, $5 billion, and then they put together the 3.5 in that plan, in that particular plan. So that probably will be uh, uh, edited as well, just to be more fitting with what it is that's in place now, or what's where we're going with, with uh, this plan. Okay, and then in the now therefore, um, I'd also like to see that changed a little bit to, um, to include what you had in the um, second to the last whereas about the legislature um, and working together um, to say something to the effect of approve the budget as presented and work with our legislatures going forward. Legislators, did that wrong? Okay, got it. And then I guess one other thing, I put another note here, sorry. Um, be it further resolved and then send the copies like you have in the other ones to all the counties, to the legislators and Mac and all that, add that to it. Good point. I, I forgot to include that in there. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. How fast do you want to see this thing move? Um, how quickly? Do you think it's ready for tomorrow? Let me, if I can just take a second and go back to his email, if that's okay, let me just switch over there. Um, well, and it does that. Um, are our legislators on spring break right now? So nothing's going to happen. In like oh. The only upside to getting it done tomorrow is that when they get back, they'll have this. But pushing another week isn't, I don't think it's going to do any damage. Yeah, he basically, he basically just says that like as of last Friday, he would have said that this verbiage would have worked, but then 
she vetoed the funds for the second time that day. And so the message is still important, um, but we don't have specific legislation anymore to reference. Okay, is there any objection uh, from the committee members on uh, putting this on the board of commissioners on the consent agenda? Jim, your audio just broke up. Can you re restate that? Yeah, do the co committee members have any objections to this uh, being put on the BOC uh, consent agenda for tomorrow? I have no problem with it, Jim. Thanks, Don. Okay, with the changes that we just discussed. Okay, uh, Annette, if you could make those changes, uh, shoot them back out to us, uh, and then I'll still call on Julie to report out on it tomorrow for, uh, for our admin uh, uh, committee, and uh, then the board can uh, can vote on it tomorrow. So I think tomorrow is okay, Annette. Okay, so when I get his um, when I get his response, I'll uh, get the edited resolution back out to you both uh, to you all, and then I will also include his communications with that just so you it gives you more background on that that you might need okay thank you Annette. any other uh discussion on this topic the resolution okay not hearing any we'll move to the next item which is approval uh use of county property okay i'm going to try this Sorry, I was gonna try and do that a different way, but um, that's not gonna work. So we'll have to do it with the room uh, volume. So um, this request to use county property is one that the administration committee has seen in the past. Um, last year, this um, this request or was, I mean, we didn't need it because the event was canceled. Um, so this has gone to the city of St. Joe and has been approved by them but because the property where it is held for the start um, is our property, we have them fill this out and submit that um, to us for approval by the administration committee. Um, I, one of the questions that I had after reading it was, I'm not sure where we're at right now as far as restrictions goes for outside events. I, I don't remember what the numbers are. And I don't see anything in here about how that's going to be handled if there's still restrictions in place. Um, that was kind of the only thing that I saw. I do have a call into him about that, uh, but I haven't heard back from him yet. Yeah, I noticed that too, Annette. And I was just thinking uh, below the first paragraph of the contract, just putting a, uh, a sentence or two in there about uh, the, uh, the organizer and the uh, a whoever the requesting agency is, will comply with CDC and state health guidelines. I think that that would pretty much cover it, really, Let, and leave it up to them. Any thoughts from the committee members adding that? I agree, and maybe just put the word current in front of it so that it's whatever it is on the day of the event is what they have to follow. Very good, thanks, Julie. Don, how are you? I let me mute myself. I'm okay with it. Where you, where you guys have put it, I think it's great. Okay. And Annette, I, I just kind of like to make note, this is only temporary. Uh, that couple sentences that you put in there is only for right now. Uh, as soon as we are beyond this pandemic, you could remove that and go back to the standard form. Okay. But I got to correct myself, dude. I, I didn't mean guys. I, I just, they're okay. Hey. Not offended by that at all, Don. You oh, use that generically. I just, want, I just want to clear that up. Thank you. Hey, I use that generically too, Don. That kind of okay. includes everybody. All right. Okay. Uh, Annette, are you clear on uh, on what we have discussed here? I am clear, yes. Got it. Okay. And the committee members are okay with moving this forward. So let's see. Next item, I guess, is public comments, Annette. And you do have some public comments. Um, Jennifer, do you want to note the minutes that um, Commissioner Valrath left at like 105? Please, thank you. Mm. I have it noted he left at 107. 
Oh, okay. Sorry. I didn't know you could see my head. <laughs> I think it was 108. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I have 108 and a half. <laughs> Might have been 109. Oh, my goodness. It's a tough crowd today. All right. Um, so the, you have public comments from Tony Benhart of Soda Township. Um, has a question, why is Hillendale still on the SOTUS list after the township has told uh, the road department two times now that they do not want it done as they are doing other projects? So why is the road department insisting to do Hillendale if this is the case? The county needs to, I think that means pay the cost. The township wants nothing done on Hillendale at all. Uh, I feel the funding that the funding needs to be looked into as it is not fair from what I am hearing. Does every road department vehicle now have the GPS units in them and working? Also, why are employees allowed to talk on cell phones while driving a vehicle that requires a CDL license? And those are the end of public comments. Okay, thank you, Annette. Uh, anything else from the committee members? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. So we had a Chris Cook on here earlier, and I, I just forgot to mention that uh, Chris had joined uh, on my request. Uh, so Chris was out at Rhodes today. Uh, Chris Cook is with Abbott Marsh. And uh, today he was out meeting with Kevin Stack and some of uh, the officials at Road Department. And uh, he did sit in and watch today's presentation. And then uh, starting next week, I believe his plan is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, he'll be over there working uh, with the team at Rhodes. Great. Thanks for that update, Brian. No problem. And do you want to add, Brian, about the memo that's being sent to the township since being communicated with them? Yeah, thanks. So Chris has been working with myself and with Annette on uh, just putting together some communications that will be uh, sent to all the, uh, the townships, um, to all the supervisors. And then um, I'll push that out to the admin committee as well as to the board. Okay, thank you, Brian. Anything else? No, sir. Okay, I just have one last item here. Uh, uh, we've discussed uh, resolution B2103179. Um, at this particular time, that's the resolution that uh, Commissioner Werfel and Frayling put together. Uh, that we are going to kind of sit on that for right now uh, and not move that forward. Am I correct, Julie? Sorry, correct. Okay, great. Okay, if there's nothing else before uh, the administration committee meeting, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>